Thanks everybody for being here. I'm excited to uh, talk about some books with you. <clears throat> um, I'll say if you can't hear me, just wave. These, these are hard to, to speak through, so if you can't hear me, just give me a wave and I'll try to speak up. Um, I also have uh, one extra copy, uh, a transcript of my talk, if anyone um, is having particular trouble hearing, and, and I just let me know and I can hand that to you. Um, all right, so in this year's Freeze Lecture Series, we've taken a tour of the Western world's greatest literature and our discussion of the best books ever. We've been to Ireland with Daedalus and the Blooms, to ancient Greece with Odysseus, and around the world with Mason, Dixon, and Reverend Cherry Coke. But we in the Midwest have a venerable tradition of literature too. The books I'll present today for your consideration are local in nature, won by Iowa City author and often dubbed national treasure, Marilyn Robinson, and won by a writer who grew up around Des Moines and now lives in southwest Wisconsin. These books are smaller in scope than the aforementioned ones. They depict the day-to-day -day lives of rural Midwesterners, yet they're nonetheless expansive within their interiority. Epics in miniature, if you will. Epics of place, albeit places long forgotten and overlooked. Imaginary yet richly incarnate. <clears throat> First, I have to give a disclaimer. Unlike my friends and predecessors in this year's Freeze Lectures, Drs. McDowell and Day, Professor Beeble, I have no particular expertise in these books. I have neither dissertation nor soon to be published book of lit crit. <laughs> Instead, I offer mere readerly enthusiasm <laughs> and an evangelistic fervor to get you to read or reread them. By the way, uh, by a show of hands, who has read Gilead before? Fantastic. Uh, I bet any of you could probably give this talk better than me, but um, let's at least make sure to, to dialogue about it uh, in the Q&A afterward. <clears throat> So, Marilyn Robinson's Gilead was published in 2004, in the early days of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, midway through the presidency of George W. Bush, and years before the Iowa caucuses launched a young man from Chicago with an unusual name on his way to the White House. Gilead's depiction of the 1950s American Midwest, with many detours to the prior century, especially the American Civil War, seems more prescient than ever today. But this isn't a book about war as such, though those battles do form a backdrop for the war at home. As the back cover says, it's a book about fathers and sons and the spiritual battles that still rage in America's heart. Gilead boasts a devastating opening sentence, and those of you who have read it, I know it sticks in your mind. I told you last night that I might be gone sometime. And you said, where? And I said, to be with the good Lord. And you said, why? And I said, because I'm old. And you said, I don't think you're old. And in that first sentence, level one of the narrative conflict is introduced. John Ames, a 76-year-old Congregationalist minister in 1956 Gilead, Iowa, is dying. He'll leave behind a wife half his age and a young son. A minister in the rural Midwest, like his father before him and his father before him, Ames is a humble man, content to observe and recount his family history, his begats, as he tells his son, but also the ordinary, everyday, transcendent beauty of the world that we often miss unless we're looking to savor the last of it. But there are other conflicts, too, in this quiet, meditative, epistolary novel. Ames tells the story of his grandfather, a Union soldier and self-styled prophet, preaching the spiritual necessity of going to war to free the slaves, while Ames and his father resist and decry this violence as anti-Christian a position equally informed by their reading of scripture. And conflicts like this are the same ones we read Ash today here in Northern Illinois, well-meaning people 
committed to similar values of decency and righteousness, yet deadlocked because of our interpretations and applications of those values. That's one conflict, but the novel's primary conflict, again, is man versus nature. In this case, aims against his ailing heart, the fact that the son of his old age will grow up fatherless. So Ames takes it upon himself to write a 246-page letter to his son to help make up for his impending absence. Marilyn Robinson enacts perfectly the epistolary form, the letter form, eschewing chapter and section divisions in favor of what seem initially loosely linked vignettes, but which a careful reader will soon identify as painstakingly woven together. Despite Ames's religious vocation, his epistolary style is nothing like, say, St. Paul's. No firebrand castigation or earnest pleas for unity here. Perhaps instead we could compare Ames's approach to the mysticism and quiet encouragement to the beloved of St. John, author of his gospel, three epistles, the book of Revelation. But where St. John sees visions of dragons and the end of time, John Ames sees only the end of his own time on earth and recounts visions of transcendence through everyday encounters. But man versus his own heart, his impending death, is not the only conflict here. One third of the way through, another character enters the story. John Ames Boughton, or Jack, a namesake and foil for John Ames. The son of Ames's best friend, Reverend Boughton, Jack is a prodigal son in exile, soon to return home. Upon learning this, Reverend Ames immediately begins to struggle, quietly but mightily, to forgive, to offer Jack the same grace he preaches Sunday after Sunday. But with his young wife and young son to worry about, Ames isn't sure he can forgive Jack's dark secret, nor can he even bring himself to reveal it to his son, and therefore to us, until nearly the end of the novel. Notably, until Jack shows up, Ames seems more or less at peace with his impending death, but he quickly becomes unsettled, not only by Jack's return, but by his own fixation on the young man and his, inabil his inability to forgive him. <clears throat> And Jack, by the way, gets to tell his own side of the story in the fourth and most recent novel in Robinson's Gilead series. Has anyone read Jack yet? Okay, it's very, very interesting. Um, I'm not here to talk about that one. <laughs> All of this is told in riveting, quietly dazzling prose. Flip to any page, point to a random sentence, and you'll be transfixed by the understated beauty, the pitch perfect voice of this narrator, his astute observations of the world. But if you allow yourself to then settle into that sentence, to let it work on you, you'll become aware of its figurative weight. Aware of, as Ames writes, the feeling of a weight of light, pressing the damp out of the grass, and pressing the smell of sour old sap out of the boards on the porch floor, and burdening even the trees a little as a late snow would do. It was the kind of light that rests on your shoulders the way a cat lies on your lap. You don't so much read this novel as inhabit it. According to the New York Times book review, Gilead, quote, teaches us how to read it, suggests how we might slow down to walk at its own processional pace. And Ames' steady, captivating voice is our guide. That narrative voice is both poignant and droll, sometimes switching between the two within a single line. For example, from the first page, you, talking to his son, of course, you gave me that look I never in my life saw on any other face besides your mother's. It's a kind of furious pride, very passionate and stern. I'm always a little surprised to find my eyebrows unsinged after I've suffered one of those looks. And then, 
the immediate gut punch of four words, I will miss them. While loss imbues nearly every sentence here, so do joy and beauty, popping up in the most unusual places. Uh, at one point, Ames uh, recollects a memory of, quote, a young couple strolling along half a block ahead of me. The sun had come up brilliantly after a heavy rain, and the trees were glistening and very wet. On some impulse, plain exuberance, I suppose, the fellow jumped down and caught hold of a branch, and a storm of luminous water came pouring down on the two of them. And they laughed and took off running, the girl sweeping water off her hair and her dress as if she were a little bit disgusted, but she wasn't. It was a beautiful thing to see, like something from a myth. Clearly, Ames would seem to agree with the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning that Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. Ultimately, Gilead is a love letter, not only to Ames' son, but to the world. As Ames says early on, this is an interesting planet. It deserves all the attention you can get. It. I chose Gilead as the best book ever because of its scope. Even in miniature, like one of Joseph Cornell's boxes, an entire century of US history. Through the eyes and recollections of one rural Midwestern man who stays faithful and stays rooted in the place where he grew up. So that's Gilead. And now pause and turn to another lifetime Midwesterner who's also a keen observer of the deceptively complicated realities of rural life. So I want to talk now about David Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S. Uh, anybody familiar with David Rhodes? Okay. Um, I only heard of him from a recommendation from a librarian, so I'm very pleased to bring this full circle. I'm very glad to have that recommendation. David Rhodes was an up-and-coming young novelist in the early 70s. He'd attended the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop and published three critically acclaimed novels in rapid succession. The first one sold to Little Brown before he'd even graduated. And then his life ground to a halt. Two weeks after the birth of his first child, a motorcycle accident broke his back, paralyzing him from the sternum down and ending his marriage. Thirty years of silence followed. His three novels long out of print and forgotten before he was rediscovered by utter chance, according to a feature story in a 2008 issue of Poets and Writers magazine, a college student in Grand Rapids happened to come across a mention of Rhodes in a seminal book on craft in writing starting a chain of minor events that led a young editor from Milkweed Editions to come knocking on the writer's door. Thankfully, Rhodes had been writing all this time and was ready for something new to show. David Rhodes reemerged on the literary scene in 2008 with the publication of Driftless, a novel about the residents of the 300-person imaginary village of Words, Wisconsin in the Driftless region. The novel's short, vignette-like chapters, almost like individual flash fictions, narrate the interactions and inner thoughts of a handful of words residents. Rhodes has sometimes been compared to Sherwood Anderson, and Anderson's masterpiece, Winesburg, Ohio, certainly seems an influence here. The structure and perspective of Driftless are quite different from that of Gilead. Instead of a consistent first person, Driftless is narrated in a close third person voice of about a dozen characters. And in each of those various protagonists, one can spy glimmers of Rhodes' shattered life and his clawing towards the light. Winifred Smith, the young, newly installed pastor of the Words Friends of Jesus Church, 
experiences ecstatic visions and grapples with her emerging understanding that faith is more mysterious and confounding and liberating than she ever realized. I'll read a short excerpt from the section containing Pastor Winnie's epiphany. The miracle of consciousness, the hiding place of God, split open like a fruit too large for its peel. Time lost its linear appeal and assumed the form of the holy, holy. Events, forces, and mind were the same thing, creatively at work. The world and the kingdom of God became factually identical. Each existed, one in the other. Death stood before her and she recognized it. A mere shadow cast by life, not a separation. The breathing of life bounded up as shape binds substance. A few pages later, met by another character, July Montgomery, she says, I don't understand how anyone can not believe in God. What else can satisfy our desire to at once understand and love? Never made any sense to me, July says. A man in the sky, writing laws, judging actions, and deciding fate? Oh no, says Winnie, not that guy. Did you think I was talking about that guy? I guess I did. Not even the old me could believe in that God. I mean, I tried, but I couldn't. That God died a long, long time ago, if it ever existed, which I seriously doubt. Which one were you talking about? You know, the only real one. Oh, how impossible this all is. John Ames from Gilead might not have put it in exactly those terms, but he seems to share a similar sentiment about mystery, the holiness of wholeness, the understanding that death is just a shadow of life. This character, July Montgomery, is, I would say, the most Rhodes-like character, and he was actually uh, introduced to us in another novel that Rhodes wrote before his accident, uh, the Remarkable Rock Island Line is the title, Rock Island Line, in which uh, July Montgomery is the lone protagonist. We meet July again in the beginning of Driftless, and he recalls his arrival in words 20 years prior, disoriented, lost, and without worldly possessions, haunted by memories of his wife, murdered in their youth. So long a drifter, July returns at last to this region where he was born, having, quote, understood that he had gone as far as he could. His life had grown too thin, and he was nearing the end of himself. He knew no one in the sense of understanding them from the inside, feeling the center of their life, and no one knew him. He'd come here to words. He knew then as a last stand to either become in some way connected to other people or to die. He could no longer live as a hungry ghost. He began walking into words. Whatever people he found there would occupy him in one way or another for the rest of his life. For better or worse, this place would become his home. So these characters intersect in interesting ways, each interaction revealing another piece of who they are. The idea that, quote, the completed picture of an individual is held compositely among all those who know them was the inspiration for this novel. Rhodes reveals in an interview that the, un, quote, the untimely death of a friend and neighbor provided the original impetus for this story. At his funeral, I understood that I knew only a small part of him. This presented me with a new way of looking at personal identity, at who we are or think we are. And it was this more dynamic idea of collective interaction giving rise to the qualities of personal identity that I wanted to attempt in this book. But what Rhodes doesn't explain 
is that the setting itself is just as much a character as any of these colorful and utterly plausible residents of words. Driftless opens with a short prologue that contextualizes the novel in glacial time, briefly recounting the geological shaping of the driftless region before moving to the influx of animals, then indigenous peoples, and finally immigrants from Europe. So Rhodes, in the span of two pages, masterfully summarizes millions of years of history. Soon he brings us up to speed on what occurred over the last century. Quote, times changed. First, the railroads came, or rather didn't come, to words. Then electricity and telephones, cars and interstate highways, all promising more community, commerce, and culture. But one by one, those promises were broken to words. The economy restructured, large families divided, and words filled with abandoned homes, rusted automobiles without wheels, on streets named for families no longer there. The new dominant culture moved on, forgot about words, and thousands of similar rural communities as though they had never existed. It's telling to me that both of these books are named for the places they describe, not the characters themselves, although of course the places are made up of the people and, and are shaped by them. Uh, there's a slight echo of the passage I just read much later in the novel, when a blizzard blankets the village and nearly claims the lives of two children, their father flashes back, not only to his childhood, but before that. Quote, he saw his land when his parents and grandparents farmed it. And before it was a farm, when the singing people walked across it on their way to the river, carrying their children, he saw everything he had ever known and ever hoped to know. Notably, it's an old oak tree that provides life-saving shelter for the children and a point of direction for the father to navigate the storm's whiteout. But as soon as the storm passes, the father cuts a length of snow fence, carries it through the snow, places it in a circle around the oak at the top of the hill. To the fence, he wires a wooden sign, warning, no one harm this tree. The man then changes his life deciding against the act of domestic terrorism he planned ever since he was introduced to us in the beginning of the book. As one Reverend Ames or another might have said, nature, like God, can wound you, but in the wounding, you may yet be healed. And when a main character in the book does die, tragically and senselessly, as so often happens, and as David Rhodes knows as well as anyone, that person's death brings together those they loved and who loved them. The book ends with a funeral, just as it was inspired by one. As in Gilead, death is inevitable, inescapable, but life goes on despite it, and death in turn gives urgency and meaning to life. Early in Driftless, July Montgomery observes, quote, the dead forever change the living. But there's no resurrection here, nor is there clear redemption for more than a handful of characters. In this novel, Rhodes doesn't seem as interested in that. Like July Montgomery, Rhodes is content to be an observer, letting people evolve slowly without comment, just as the region has and does. Rhodes' 2013 sequel to Driftless, called Jewel Week, which may be even better than Driftless, but I'm not here to talk about that either. This book is much more concerned with redemption for every single one of its very cast of characters. Reading Jewelweed, one can almost see Rhodes settling into his second life. Like Job, the biblical archetype of human suffering, Rhodes enters a post-grief period of plenty. A new wife, new readers, a resurgence of interest in his work, and from interviews I've read of him, seeming content with his lot. 
So the last words of my talk today will come from John Ames in Gilead. He says, our dream of life will end as dreams do end. Sorry, our dream of life will end as dreams do end, abruptly and completely, when the sun rises, when the light comes. And we will think, all that fear and all that grief were about nothing. But that cannot be true. I can't believe we will forget our sorrows altogether. That would mean forgetting that we had lived, humanly speaking. <clears throat> Sorrow seems to me to be a great part of the substance of human life. Both Robinson and Rhodes have done a marvelous job capturing those long days of suffering and constant glimpses of joy we all experience as humans, particularly in the rural Midwest, and synthesizing those into masterpieces that should endure for centuries to come. Thanks. have some time for a few questions or comments or if you want to give the elevator version of your lecture so that I can learn from you, I'd, I'd love to hear it. John Ames is just, it just seems perfect to me. And I wonder if you had something of a similar experience that, that I didn't have. It, it sounds like it still seems that, that accurate to you, which is one of the things that I find most amazing about this, that she could write so well in the voice of a male Congregationalist minister of 76. You know? Yeah, it's remarkable. Thank you. I think there was another Comments that say is I also greatly enjoyed this novel and I really appreciate the little things that were like the human emotion, for instance, uh, really jealousy of this younger man that was, you know, young and furry and maybe even now he's white. I thought that was interesting. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in some of my research for this talk, you know, I was. I was reading some reviews, and, and some of them, I forget who said it, but some of them were like, you know, this is one of the hardest characters to write. Uh, the clergyman who is not a crook, right, is not corrupt. He's devout, right? He's, he's, he's humble. He's, he's all these good things. And yet, he has this burning jealousy, right, and distrust, and this grudge, and this inability to forget. So I just think that's... It's so interesting how you can even see as you read it, he's very reluctant to even broach that, to even talk about it at first. But it kind of uncovers itself as you go through the book. Yeah. Yeah. The first time I read it, I did not care for it at all. And then I read it again, and I really liked it. And I think I actually lived in Tabor for two years, just with its face on yeah. that town. And I had no idea I would have that history until I moved there. It's not a 980 people um, we live there at one, one 
person of color, <laughs> I think. Um, so when we first got there, we walked around and there were um, just, there's plaques everywhere. Um, the first college was there, um, and then there's the Underground Railroad houses and you could actually take tours of them. Just like, this is so bizarre, because I would have never thought that. So then I reread it, and it just kind of, it totally, because I could picture the setting because I was living there, I was like, this is an amazing book. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm sorry I came late, I really wanted to get here on time, but it was a great talk. I've actually read the other book too, and it's fascinating. I, I love how you did that. Very good. Yeah, and, and I should I should admit too, since, since Angela fessed up, um, I I tried several times to read this book and failed. It it was recommended to me many many years ago. I think maybe when I was in grad school, and I found it at a thrift store. Oh, okay, it sat on my shelf for years, years, and I picked it up and tried to read it, and I, I think I just wasn't ready for it. I wasn't I wasn't there yet, and you have to be very patient with this book because of the way it unfolds the way it kind of works on you. But I, I find that's another reason I consider this a candidate for best book ever, because it does yield up so much after repeated readings. Yeah, thank you for that. Other questions or comments? I have a comment, not a question. Um, so I can't remember exactly what year I read Hilda, but uh, I'm a big fan of Wendell Berry. Yeah. And so for me, it kind of had that sort of, you know, evocation of Yes. Yeah, that's that sense of place, and, uh, and, 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 and and here's the thing, I don't really remember like plot details, okay, plot is fine, like, like, like details are a little hard, but I, didn't, I remember the feeling of reading it and just feeling very much like, I love this book. That's all I mean, like, so like okay, well, what's your review? Like, well, I felt uh, that lot of feelings about this book. So, you know, like that kind of feeling that did not tell you much about. Ironically, I was I was sitting in a, a Midwest writing book well, no, house, the David Collins, you know, writers, uh, whatever that workshop that happens every year, and this was a long time ago, and I went to go to a, a workshop that I didn't care for, so I popped over to the so you want to write a novel, and I know I never wanted to write a novel, but I'd rather listen to what that person had to say than the workshop I was in, so I popped into this place. And I won't mention who the person is because he is kind of a little bit of a local uh, celebrity of sorts. Um, but he's a writer and he writes not this type of novel. And he was saying, like, you need to have like these bullet points and you need to have like, you know, like, what would you be your like New York Times bestseller? Like, you know, and like, you know, and he kind of had this like, how to write a novel, like, kind of like the Da Vinci Code, like, how to write this, you know, bestseller. And he goes, and then, and this is the thing, unlike, Marilyn Robinson's Gillian, and I was just, I was like, I just, I was like laying on the floor practically, and I'm like, no, I, I would want to write Gillian, you know, who, who wants to, you know, I was like, I don't want to write, it. you know, so it was sort of this like, I didn't want to write a novel, and I don't want to think I'll write a Gillian, but I was sort of having that like, I was sort of devastated that this person was like, you know, because he was kind of saying, it doesn't go anywhere fast, it's not very inch, and I'm thinking like. I'm in the anyway, so that's just funny because, you know, like, and there I was kind of going, it's beautiful, it's literary, it's, it deserves all the accolades, you know, he's looking at me like, it's a snoozer, it doesn't, you know, so yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of an anti-novel in some ways, I think. I mean, it's, it has more in common with poetry, I think, than a lot of fiction, and, and that's part of why I chose it, too. I wanted to... Um, include poetry in this discussion of best books ever, but I guess this was as close as I got. But I'm glad, Elizabeth, you brought up Wendell Berry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole, I read Jaber Crow um, this summer um, by Wendell Berry, and the whole time I'm rereading these books, I'm like, oh man, there is so much in common here. The, um, the July Montgomery character in Driftless is so much like Jaber Crow. Um, just that sort of observer on the outskirts, never fully integrated into society, in, in society into the village. Um, and and just, just kind of a loner, but, but he's kind of a window in on, on all of the other characters and, and doing so. So yeah, if, if I could have talked about a third book, I might have included Wendell Berry in there too. Um, there's a lot of overlap and influence there. 
Any other thoughts, questions, discussion? Well, we do have coffee. <laughs> so unless there are other questions, we'd be very happy to, and I'm grateful that uh, Lucas is very happy to answer those questions, but if there aren't, uh, I'd just like to start where we began, and that's with thanks. I want to thank you for being here today and, and throughout the series, and I want to thank uh, Amy and Lisa and Angela and the whole team here at the library for all this great stuff, but most of all, I'd like you to join me in thanking our presenter, Lucas Street. Thank you.